has a PhD from this department at the University of Sydney, and as well as electoral integrity um, studies, experiments on terrorism and charts and things like that. And I won't misrepresent him anymore, so thanks very much, Tom. Thank you. Yes, look, I'm working on a research agenda. Uh, I feel like I can get election sharks and terrorism all in together. <laughs> it's, a, it's a little bit nebulous so far, but I'll try and bring it all together. There's enough new faces here that I can go into some of the methodology without boring all of you, so just 80% of you, so please bear with me uh, while I do so. I uh, just want to note up front that we do have copies of the year in elections report uh, that this draws from up front. If you do get very excited and want to read 60 pages of uh, the, the glory that is the PEI data, uh, please feel free to come up and grab them. So, I'm just going to run through very quickly the methods and key results and then focus on clientelism, corruption and coercion, which is the focus of the thematic section of this report then go through some conclusions and then give you access to all of the data. This whole project is open source, uh, so anything you see that sparks your interest is available. Everything is at the uh, expert election and country level. Every question is in there. We produce a code book. It's all a, a big open source thing. So I run the expert survey, so the core of what we do is built around the concept of electoral integrity, which refers to not my perceptions of what electoral integrity is, or the experts, or uh, some sort of definition based in the academic literature. These are universal guiding assumptions built on uh, core norms uh, through the UN General Assembly accepted international commitments and deviations away from these core commitments we characterise as electoral malpractices. There's some terminal, terminology which is uh, maldistinguished in the literature. We prefer these terms for conceptual clarity. So the survey goes out one month after every election to every country in the world with a population of above 100,000. Uh, so we're currently at 164 out of 194, so the UN nations plus Taiwan. The discrepancy is in very small island nations and countries who've had their elections uh, postponed and postponed and postponed, thinking Lebanon, other countries like this, or do not have constitutional provisions for elections on the book. So this is a rolling survey, so it's currently uh, in the process of being gathered. We've just had uh, Finland and the Czech Republic, and then I'll be sending out some more today, I think Costa Rica and Cyprus. So we currently have a role of 10,000 experts, and the PEI 6 report and data covers 3,253 experts, 285 elections, and 164 countries. So the way we define uh, an expert is a social scientist, predominantly political scientist, uh, who has expertise in the field, rights on elections, and expertise in a specific country. So in the master list, we've got the country that they're an expert in and full documentation of the reason why we think that they are an expert. We also have uh, professionals who work or have previously worked for election management bodies. And we do a lot of snowballing where experts will recommend other experts, we bring them in, and then uh, I vet them. I've got. Uh, at least one of my research assistants here who goes through the process of collecting them and then so we screen them before every send out. Our response rate is about 30% which is pretty good, we're always trying to get it up there and the RAs do a, a huge amount of work to make sure that that is uh, as high as possible. The structure of the survey is pretty simple, it's just a strongly agree to strongly disagree scale for every item and they're pretty simple statements that uh, the experts should be able to answer fairly coherently. Where we do have missing data, we use a process of multiple imputation by chain equations to replace the missing data. So we produce a sub-dimension for each of these. So these are four of the different sub-dimensions. Uh, and then those are added together to produce the overall PEI index, which if our marketing team has been doing its job well, uh, you should be at least vaguely familiar with. So we cover 
uh, 11 stages of the electoral cycle and this really is a, a chain link. Any substantial deviation uh, from electoral integrity on any one of these can throw up the whole, whole process. It's entirely possible to have fine laws, procedures and boundaries but then you rig the count. Or you could have a perfectly valid count but your voter registration process uh, massively disenfranchises some marginalised population. What we uh, will be focusing on today is the campaign finance dimension. It's one of the dimensions the country struggle most on and no country does particularly well on it, so it makes it an interesting case to look at some of the discrepancies in uh, country performance on this metric and why countries do poorly or well on it. So some quick key results. This is our map, which we're hoping to make famous because we're tweeting it uh, all the time and trying to get it out in the social media and in, in all the spaces. It gives you a good overall sense of the state of electoral integrity around the world, but you do miss some of the dimensionality of the subdimensions in this. Uh, you can perform okay in a new country like Singapore does relatively well despite uh, some specific sub-dimensions where there are very severe problems. But this you know, gives, you, gives you an okay sense of it. In the stages of the electoral cycle, uh, the reason to focus on campaign finance is it's by far the worst sub-dimension. When people think of electoral integrity, they often think about uh, lost ballot boxes or issues with the count. I'm thinking the, uh, issues that are followed on from the Honduran election. These are sort of big problems where there's dramatic uh, invalidation of the legitimacy of the election through the count, but more commonly issues of campaign finance, media coverage and voter registration. Areas where there are genuine grey areas on what should and shouldn't be allowed on voter registration, it's perfectly valid to want to keep the process secure but in doing so, you can disenfranchise marginalised groups. There are political issues associated with this. Uh, in Australia, the UK and the US, the political right tends to want to secure things. There's an electoral benefit to that. The political left tend to want to loosen it. There's an electoral benefit to that. So it's challenging to uh, say exactly what the best process is for all of these things. Similarly with media coverage, Anyone who reads any newspaper uh, will have views on the problems associated with coverage of political events. Similarly with campaign finance, it is generally accepted that there needs to be some place for money in politics, but where do you draw the line? Is money speech? Is it valid to have uh, dramatic interventions in elections by big money interests? So as opposed to the lovely rainbow map that we had before, this is the campaign finance map. Things are sort of real not good. It's nice and red uh, all around the only countries. Even Sweden drops out. You know you've got problems when Sweden is not in the top bracket for anything. Uh, so we've got Denmark, Denmark, Finland, uh, Norway and Germany doing very well. Other than that, everyone doing pretty poorly. Even Australia, uh, which generally does pretty well in most of the sub-dimensions, is only in the moderate category which is a bit disappointing for us, but if you think about it, I mean, there are lots of places where money has intruded on Australian politics, most recently in the Tasmanian election. Uh, the Labor Party taking on big money, taking on the pokies, uh, and then having large-scale donations to their opponents and then losing that election previous to that. Uh, the efforts of the Rudd government to enact a mining tax, they got targeted with mass campaigns against them by the mining industry, uh, leaked polling sponsored by the mining industry run through their pollsters and they shared a pollster, the mining industry and the Liberal Party, which makes it very difficult. Huge issues of uh, money and politics around the world. What this doesn't tell us though, what the core items in the campaign finance index don't tell us is actually how it works in practice on the ground. So this covers the basics of equitable access to subsidies, political donations and transparency of financial accounts. And then some a little bit closer of improper use of state resources and the straight up rich people by elections. But again, it doesn't really tell you about the actual processes. 
So what we do is every year we have a rotating battery of new items that speak to some aspect of electoral integrity that is beyond what is in the core of it. Uh, and so 2016 we had a rotating battery of corruption and coercion, including the items voters were bribed, people received cash gifts or personal favours in exchange for their vote, and uh, politicians offered patronage. You might think that this is a bribe, if you receive cash gifts or personal favours in exchange for your vote, bribe. Not so much, there's quite a lot of uh, difference between the expert interpretations of the bribery question and the what we'll call the clientelism question in context outside of the Western developed nations. It is the status quo for there to be some sort of direct exchange rather than the programmatic policies that we're used to uh, in Australia and other parts of the developed world. So <coughs> in addition to the items relating to money, we also have items on coercion and then one on confidential confidentiality <coughs> of the ballot. If the ballot confidentiality is uh, broken, if you can monitor who has voted for which party, you can be punished or inducements can be withdrawn. So this is the core item for which we have all of the countries because we've been running it for a number of years. Uh, and you can see we've got this lovely Christmas effect with the United States and Canada. Uh, but the experts endorse the idea that rich people buy elections all around the world, again, Australia, only in the moderate category. Fairly disappointing. Uh, but what this doesn't tell us, again, is how it actually happens in practice. So definitionally, clientelism can be understood as different from other forms of distributive, distributive and redistributive politics in its contingent and its targeted nature. It's an explicit quid pro quo in which an excludable good is withdrawn if there is a failure to comply with what the patron wants. So in some senses, swing seat campaigning in Australia, uh, pork barrel politics, these kind of things are a, a balance between giving something and taking something back, but there isn't that explicit quid, quid pro quo. It's not a contingent exchange. It's please vote for us, we will give you the thing that you want. And the accountability mechanism runs in that direction, where the political elites are accountable to the public uh, and not the other way around. In a clientelist system, the voters are accountable to the politicians because the politicians control the excludable good. So, in practice, uh, this gets a little bit complicated because the dynamics of clientelism are dramatically different around the world, but in a broad sense, um, sort of putting aside cultural, historical, political background and institutional dynamics, what is bought is generally four things, votes, turnout, abstention, or what's called double persuasion of your vote and your turnout. Uh, buying a vote makes sense, that's something which is pretty straightforward. Why would you buy abstention? It's often easier to monitor a group staying home than it is to uh, validate that they have voted in the way that you've asked them to. So if you target an area that is likely to vote for a party that is not your own, you can say, you guys stay home, we'll be watching. Easier to monitor. With turnout, often the point of buying turnout is not necessarily to swing a vote or to, to win an election, but rather to bolster the credibility of an election that would otherwise be deemed illegitimate. So we think of upcoming Russian contests or pass on Juran contests. Uh, if the election result is more or less decided already, the core focus is on making sure that enough people turn out uh, to stave off threats or criticisms from the international community about the validity of the result. So with the Kenyan election in 2017, the, the rerun version, uh, the turnout dropped half. There was a boycott by uh, the, the core opposition uh, candidate. And the international community said, well, you know, turnout dropped by half, this is not really a credible result. So you might buy turnout in these circumstances in order to bolster the credibility of the election. Uh, getting the turnout and the vote double persuasion, I mean, that's, that's fantastic if you can pull it off. Uh, tends to need some sort of accountability mechanism to make sure that you get what you pay for. Who, so I worked really hard on making this rhyme, so I hope you appreciate it. <laughs> Who do patrons target? Core swing, poor string. Uh, core and swing, that's very well established in the literature. String I've made up to make it rhyme. But 
do you give resources to the people who are your people in order to reward them for supporting you? The instrumental justification for this is that clientless networks are built up over time, so you need to be constantly uh, making sure that there is this balance of give and take. And in this sense, it's not so different from a lot of democratic politics, but quid pro quo. Swing voters, so think about this in Australian context, uh, in majoritarian systems in particular, because there are wasted votes and there's an imbalance in the relative value of a vote, uh, it makes more instrumental sense to target the votes that count and say, you know, your, your vote is worth more, so we're going to give you resources, because you can't just give uh, resources to everyone. The diminished marginal utility of a poor person's vote makes them the uh, court cohort who is most targeted. This is sort of expanded out to countries. Uh, you expect to see widespread clientelism in countries where votes are relatively cheaper for what they're worth in grand context. To try and buy a vote in Australia would be very expensive, probably prohibitively expensive. String voters. Um, so there's a solid argument in the literature that it's not about buying a single vote and the exchange that you get is the value of that vote for what you're giving them. It's about identifying uh, influential people to swing their vote and get them to snowball what you have bought into more votes. One of the, the central complexities of this literature is the degree of personalization that is necessary to constitute clientelism. If I represent uh, a street vendors group and I have the political connection and this person you know, says they'll give me X if I deliver these votes and the X is going to be licenses to continue my street vending. Again, not so different from a union saying, you know, we will mobilize behind you if we get uh, you know, the, the tariff barriers we need or, or something like this. So the, the argument that is made is that there's relatively uh, inefficient value in straight buying an individual vote and getting that as the value proposition. But if you can mobilize that into a larger group of people, uh, then you have some positive effect. Again, massive regional variation in what matters, what constitutes uh, the, the sell end of the exchange. In sub-Saharan Africa, land rights are important. One of the great values of this, I mean awful, but great values of this is that you can use it when the coffers are dry. Uh, you can say, we will target some group that is marginalized and we will take their land and we will give it to uh, the people who support us. We will monitor who votes for who. If a village uh, doesn't turn out for the ZANU PF, uh, then you know they get punished or uh, there is again a group level versus individual exchange dynamic that uh, makes it complicated and blurs the edges of what constitutes clientelism versus other forms of politics. Public sector jobs, more common in Latin America. Uh, services, uh, for example, healthcare in societies face, I mean, facing endemic corruption, uh, access to these kind of things, even access to public and programmatic goods can be mediated by political elites and so you, know, you get access to the service that should be public and should be open access to everybody in exchange for uh, the vote that you give and then in uh, Eastern Europe and throughout many parts of Asia, simple gifts, cash, clothing, food, etc. can be uh, transacted. The compliance regulation is, in theory, the uh, confidential ballot should solve some of the, the compliance regulation issues. It should be very challenging to uh, ensure that you're getting your end of the bargain. But one, this is dependent on the uh, individual not wanting their vote to be known. If you want to broadcast your vote, I mean, in Italy you have people taking photos of their vote and you know, passing that on as evidence. In the Philippines you've got uh, carbon paper. So there, there are lots of ways of doing this. And it is the case that Clientless transactions are often uh, stimulated by the, the voter rather than the politician. They will go to political elites and say, we will vote for you if we get the thing that we want. Intermediaries and brokers can also work as surveillance networks. Uh, and then system flaws. In the Lebanese context, uh, familial assignment to ballot boxes makes it relatively easier to monitor large numbers of people. 
at once, uh, and this is mostly just an error in the institutional uh, makeup that, that makes it uh, easier for the patron to monitor it. And then social exchange. So there is an argument in the literature that it is uh, mostly a social, social psychological phenomenon in which someone does you a favour and you have to differentiate between two politicians or three politicians or whatever, and you know them not from a bar of soap, and you say, that person gave me that clothing, I remember that, and then you know, you wait for Estimating the prevalence of clientelism is notoriously difficult. I mean, it's a question of, in public opinion surveys, saying, you know, did somebody buy your vote? And you go, no, of course not. Uh, there, there are lots of instances in which it's been demonstrated that the rates of self-report are dramatically lower than the apparent rate. Uh, so there's social desirability bias, fear of persecution. There have been attempts made to ask about how prevalent is this in your neighbourhood rather than you, know, you personally. Um, that bridges the gap a little bit. International observer missions provide really useful qualitative data, but it's difficult to generalise from that and establish relative levels of it. Uh, so the standardisation and quantitative uh, measurement of it is challenging. List experiments are a really effective way of getting at the uh, effect of the social desirability and fear bias. Uh, and a few instances of list experiments that have been fairly useful in the Lebanese context, again, uh, study found that the reported estimates were about 20%, uh, and the revealed estimates of the list experiment were about 55%. So if this translates into other contexts, I mean, it, it might be possible in the future to approximate from these differences what the apparent rate is from the reported rate, but there's a lot of variables there. List experiments are promising, but uh, there's not that many of them. It's hard to scale them. Uh, there's not enough data at the moment. And so just to quickly uh, explain what a list experiment is for those of you who aren't familiar, rather than asking, have you been bribed, they say, how many of things occur? How many of these things occurred during the campaign? The control group will get four things. The treatment group will get five things. The five things includes the sensitive item, and then the difference between them is the revealed grade. That's a, that's a very crushed down, simple version of how this experiment works. So, because of all of these problems, expert surveys uh, are a useful way of supplementing this data and providing information about the. Uh, prevalence of these issues. The Democratic Accountability and Linkages Project focused pretty thoroughly on the issue of clientelism, but 10 years ago and uh, a, a limited number of countries, but still the countries that do overlap with PEI are very highly associated, which gives us some confidence that they're either measuring the same bogus thing or uh, they're genuinely measuring the construct that they're trying to measure. So, Causes and consequences of clientelism. Causes, so I'm teaching a research design class at the moment, so I shouldn't say causes. Uh, associations and uh, yeah, consequences. Mm -hmm. These are challenging because they're so highly endogenous. I mean, in the literature it's argued that clientelism causes poverty, but it's also uh, a consequence of poverty and that they sort of mutually constitute each other. Same thing with institutional weakness. So history of clientelism, history of non-democracy, resource first, majoritarianism, as previously discussed, and social trust. The social trust and the institutional weakness uh, interact in really interesting ways. There was an article in World Politics using the Democratic Accountability Linkages Project data, which demonstrated that it was bureaucratic effectiveness that was the, the core thing that explains prevalence of uh, clientelist practices in a system where you can't trust the promises of delivery of public goods, clientelist exchange seem better from the voter perspective, and it also incentivizes political elites to campaign on clientelist exchange rather than to promise programmatic goods that aren't going to be believed in anyone. The consequences are many sad faces, but there have been arguments in the literature that it's not all bad, that for many people who would be left out of the political system entirely in the absence of clientelist exchange, they're at least getting something. There is a transfer that is redistributive from the net payers of tax 
to the poorest and most marginalised communities, that could be positive. But generally, it's viewed as problematic uh, in terms of undermining commitment to liberal democracy and the establishment of democratic norms. So, after all that, uh, what do we have in the data? So the association, we use VDEMS, LibDEM for this uh, to avoid the Hall of Mirrors issue of using our own data to validate our own data. Um, so what we see in this is rather than a linear association between uh, liberal democracy and the prevalence of clientelism, we get this weird book shape. So the biggest uh, problem countries for this tend to be the partly free countries rather than the full autocracies. And the argument behind this is that fundamentally uh, the people in control of these countries have a choice between the carrot and the stick. They can take votes or they can induce them. And so at this level of the development of democracy, you're buying votes rather than simply taking them. Uh, there, there's quite a lot of variation on uh, this side of the scale where you've got uh, lots of countries that have very low levels of democracy and varying levels of carrot and stick. So if we look at corruption and coercion, uh, the full explanation for how these scales are made is in the report, which I encourage you to read. What we see is some validation of the argument made by Van Ham and Lindbergh that vote buying is actually a good sign, that it signals a move away from autocratic use of coercive uh, instruments in favour of uh, clientelism. So these are coloured and sized again by Lib Dem. Uh, we see the autocratic states tend to be under the line, whereas the hybrid states tend to be above the line, up being good for both things. So these uh, have relatively high levels of coercion, and these have relatively high levels of clientelism. So, in conclusion, uh, major challenges everywhere. Problems of money and politics are among the greatest challenges. Clientelist and corrupt practices are extraordinarily widespread. If we think back to some of the scatter plots before, the numbers of countries below the midpoint on the scale is dramatically larger than the number of countries above the midpoint. It's essentially only OECD countries, and then on the other side of things, the fully autocratic countries that have relatively low levels of clientelist practice. Effective electoral assistance can strengthen integrity. Uh, in theory, also changes to institutional dynamics, particularly uh, working to prevent identification of people's votes and assignment to familiar ballot boxes and things like that, generally a poor idea. And these flaws risk undermining public confidence in elections and liberal democracy. So, to look at all of this data, all of our data is available on electoralintegrityproject.com. All of this wonderful data uh, is available at the question level for the experts, elections, and countries. And that's it.